Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm following a lot of really interesting and good speakers. So uh, the context that I'm here is, and I was asked to be a little bit provocative about what, what we need and what we want. So to bring it really, take any context out of it, we need more data, but for less money. And I'm going to talk about uh, working with the private sector. Uh, and in that context, money is also time. So time to process and work with things. Um, really quickly, uh, I work for IDH, the Sustainable Trade Initiative, which is a not-for-profit organization based in the Netherlands, but with a lot of uh, international colleagues. Um, and we work with private sector players in the commodity supply chain space. And um, yeah, that maybe makes us a little bit different from other NGOs because yeah, with this private sector engagement is really important for us. But we're working in the space of the public good. So um, we have a couple of different roles in this space as IDH is a wide organization. We do convening work where we bring together the stakeholders, sometimes in a pre-competitive space, uh, on the consumer countryside, uh, talking about commitments, but also on the producing side to really drive the sustainable land management and uh, yeah, again, with the private sector there as well. Uh, we co-finance product, uh, so um, we are expecting to our, for our partners to also chip in. And uh, we have a strong learning and knowledge sharing, again, agenda. If you want to group it, we are working on uh, three impact themes, which are better jobs, better income, and better environment, uh, with a very strong uh, cross-cutting theme of gender. Um, looking at what IDH does, as I said, we're working with the commodity, commodity value chains which is very diverse, so from cocoa, uh, corn, pepper, um, coffee, tea, so all the big chains, beef, so all the um, deforestation commodities as well. And uh, very much dependent on what the commodity is, is where we are uh, putting our work. So it could be more on the market side, but it can be also more on the producing side. And we're working in landscapes. So and that is where we are looking not only on like one commodity chain, uh, yeah, one commodity in an area, but we are really looking, looking, taking a landscape approach, a regional, a jurisdictional approach, where we're saying who are all the players in that landscapes, and uh, yeah, how can we bring them together to joint commitments and also achievements of uh, yeah impact on all the SDGs. Um, so we're working in those landscapes, we're working towards sustainable production, combining it with uh, restoration and conservation efforts and uh, doing this in an inclusive way. And that is also where I'm situated uh, within the organization, which is the landscape finance team. Um, again, IDH as a whole is working really around this convening space where we're bringing together government, private sectors uh, to work on their environment, uh, sorry, on the enable environment. Um, and uh, yeah, in that space, we are talking about green growth plans, setting joint commitments, making land use, participatory land use plans to really see how you can drive these impacts uh, for the region from an economical point of view, from an impact view, from an inclusive point of view. Um, we're working with buyers. Uh, we're trying to create uh, um, markets, offtake commitments around sustainably produced commodities. And uh, where my team is coming in a little, little bit is also where we're working with the project developers. So we are looking for projects that are disrupting the systems uh, that are, can drive uh, impact on a large scale, uh, where we are also coming in with the technical systems facilities. And that is also what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today or where my examples are going to come from. Um, in that space, we are trying to get projects ready to be scaled, so impactful projects ready to be scaled with uh, private or planned finance investments. Uh, and also here we have, of course, the, the learning and impact tracking uh, agenda. Um, maybe on the good news side, the space is developing. There are uh, project developers out there, um, innovative entrepreneurs, who are taking up systems that really are impactful, different approaches towards sustainable land management, regenerative agriculture. So these players are out there at the moment. They're coming up. Uh, there is new systems coming. There's new initiatives coming together. So that's, that's very nice. Uh, there is a big commitment towards spending all the money in this uh, sustainable land use uh, project. But when you're looking at how this actually reached the ground, that is where it's breaking down a little bit. So we're talking billions that are being committed to making change, to creating impact. But often we see quite a lot of barriers with it. And in our case, that is so we're looking at investors, uh, is often that we're talking quite large ticket sizes. Uh, so we're, um, just to explain a little bit, 
it doesn't matter for an impact investor uh, whether it's a project for 3 million or for 30 million. The due diligence, the way that they're tracking it, the way they need to do it, it's the same overhead. So to create the most impact for the money and the least overhead, they're looking for large projects that make impact. But there is projects that are lost along the way if you're looking at that. Uh, it needs to be commercial viable projects. And <laughs> it sounds quite straightforward, but that is also uh, sometimes a barrier, especially if you're talking restoration efforts, conservation efforts. How can you make that really a business model? Um, because we're talking commercial investors. Um, and, uh, they, and this was mentioned before today already, like the ESG criteria of these investors, they're quite heavy. There are quite a lot that they're asking from projects. And again, oh, those are often like upcoming entrepreneurial impactful projects. But to, for them to go into that space where they're suddenly confronted with so many criteria that they need to track and report on, uh, that can be operationally quite a challenge for a growing organization. Um, as IDH, we have manage a couple of technical assistance facilities. And uh, this is, um, one of them is the FarmFit Fund, which is the IDH internal. So there we are the fund manager, as well as we have a technical assistance facility that is linked to it. And the focus of this, uh, it's a de-risking facility, so a guarantee facility, and the focus of it is really smallholders. So any uh, investments that are supporting the uh, inclusiveness and the income generation of smallholders. Then the land degradation neutrality fund, uh, which uh, I manage the technical system facility for. So most of the projects, uh, examples that I'm gonna mention are gonna come out of that pool. And it was already mentioned by Baron Orr, as well as one of the vehicles that is uh, being used to drive impact along land degradation neutrality. So I'm glad I'm following Baron here. He already introduced the topic. Um, uh, Agri3 fund is also a de-risking facility, a guarantee facility that is working with the together with most at the moment uh, de-risking bank investments. So they have partner in, uh, banks, which in this case is uh, Rabobank mostly, but they're looking to grow in that space. And they're also trying to create impact on the um, yeah, sustainable land use, uh, pharma, um, pharma livelihoods uh, and forest protection space. So that's their impact themes that they're looking for. And the and Green Fund, which is looking at landscape, uh, yeah, they're having a larger impact on the not only on the project, but also in surroundings. So they're preparing landscape restoration plans where the invested company also takes ownership of the protection or restoration of uh, areas in their proximity. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail. It's a, what we do as a technical system facility is very uh, tailor-made. It's very much dependent on what is needed. But if you wanna bucket it, is that we're trying to get projects ready for investment. As I said, that can be quite a lot for a company. And there are fewer projects around that are ready to absorb such large investments than you would think. Uh, so that is a space that we're working. And for investees, we're trying to maximize the impact. So these are, there's large investments coming in commercial private investment that is coming in and we are trying to integrate in the project and help it maximize also ESG systems along the way. Uh, as a TA facility, we have quite a large portfolio. We are now three and a half years operational. So we have projects around the, uh, around the globe. We are globally working or in the global uh, developing countries. Uh, these are projects that have been invested in. The Aldian Fund has at this point made uh, nine investments. Um, not all of them are mentioned because we're not doing technical assistance at least yet with all of them. Um, and the projects that are like in the phase of getting investment and uh, that we're working with. Um, it was already mentioned that we work together with uh, Conservation International over GeoHub. We engage them to help translate the work of Aaron Bohr and his colleagues uh, or his colleagues on this uh, scientific conceptual framework uh, of land degradation neutrality to translate that to project level, so national project level. I think a couple of conversations that I heard today as well were um, challenging me to think like, why does this not work for me? And I think it was exactly in the difference of setting something up that is for like a national level driving um, and monitoring and driving impacts and for a commercial company, how they would look at it. So that was interesting. And yeah, I'm not going into detail. It's, uh, it's also based on Trans.Earth, which is, um, um, is operated by the Conservation International. So we're building on other initiatives there. So now going a little bit into investments and where, where we use data, and I'm only focusing on environmental data, and these are just examples, but I think it shows case a little bit like how often in this process of going towards an investment, but also afterwards, uh, we are actually relying on environmental data, on earth data, 
and um, what we can, yeah, what we need there, and some, how that sometimes can be a, a constraint in towards funneling these investments to the ground. So the first and more obvious, I'm going to start with that for it's a commercial investors, they want their money back. Whereas I, as a technical system facility, I work with grants, but the, the fund, they want the money back. So that's, they have long tenure times, they can invest up to 10, 12 years, so that allows for sustainable transition of systems. But uh, nonetheless, they want to prove that these investments are viable, that they're possible, that you can make money off it if you have some more patience and maybe some blended finance. So that hopefully this becomes an asset class that then can be scaled with more investments going more towards private rather than blended finance. So this is really on the path towards proving uh, yeah, an asset class. And uh, on the revenue side, um, what they need to come in is with a track record. They need to be able to show that they can actually achieve what they want to do, and they need to do have financial projections. So they need to showcase how they're going to pay back basically the money and some. Um, what comes in here, we can narrow it down to yield projections, and for that you need to understand tree and crop densities, you need to understand the maturity and the age of the trees, the species that you're talking about, soil data, is it suitable for it uh, and in what way, but also more simply like location tracking, like where are my Parties, and sometimes we're working with organizations that have like nucleus farms, then it's quite easy that to track, but very often we are also working with organizations that are working with smallholders, and then you have a completely different system that you're looking at, which is quite complex. And I, I think I, we are also need to say that the carbon market, the carbon credit market is really coming up. This is uh, something that uh, more and more is being used to smoothen revenue, so um, whereas there's also funds that are solely investing in projects that are doing carbon credits, right, they are out there, but uh, the fund, especially the LDN funds, they are seeing it as an addition to stabilize the investment. Often we are talking very long rotational crops, so we're talking earlier revenue streams, so that is also coming up for like uh, where, um, yeah, that is more and more taking a place. As an example of uh, like what, where this is, a, where we used where no more information needed to be gathered in this is a project in uh, Mexico, Ejido Verde. So with uh, this um, project that is very solid in the ground, very inclusively done with uh, community, with community land, Ejidos. And uh, it's about pine resin, tapping of pine resin. And um, they have a very good approach. They have a financial model. They have the track record. But uh, the LDN fund was looking to uh, basically give more data to support these financial projections. And there we're talking uh, forest inventories, that was also already mentioned. Um, so uh, better understanding what has been planted, where they have been planting for more than 10 years. So how old are the trees? What are the expectations about yields? And give more data to it so that the projections are becoming more confident and the alien fund would be better understand it. And on top of that, they wanted to look how they can generate carbon credits and how that will help them to smoothen their financial model. Um, and that is also needs to be done in a very inclusive way. So we're talking an ethnic process of so free prior informed consent because those are indigenous people communities. So this needs to be done in a way about profit sharing. So this is the work that we supported with Ejido Verde. Um, on the impact side, because we're talking impact investors, right? So it's not only about revenue. The impact also needs to be there. And again, there, there needs to be a track record. So there needs to be a clear link between what can be achieved on impact using the practices that they're looking to sell, so the agricultural practices that they're looking to do. But you're also going to need to understand the risks. There is compliances. You need to be able to comply with international standards. You want to understand if there's leakage effects. Like, are you just pushing deforestation away from one location to the other? Um, climate change effects, and it was also mentioned already today, like, is it still to be expected in those regions to have the same yields down the line, right? This is a, this is a risk for a project as well. Water, like if you're, we're talking about large scaling uh, interventions on land use, if you're increasing that somewhere, are you affecting negatively other areas? So there are a lot of risks that need to be understood where a lot of data is needed to do that. Uh, impact projections, so the same way, you wanna also be sure that you have the possibility and some confidence of the impact that you're scaling that. Um, and for example, you need to understand like, is there the potential to scale in the sense of suitable land, for example? Uh, that is on the one hand, a social question in the sense of, can do, are there land tenures? Are there land, is there land 
available in that sense, but also in the sense are the, uh, is the land suitable uh, for the same growth projection, same yield projection that you would expect. And we're also seeing more and more that we want to understand the impact not only on the project, like on the actual boundaries, within the boundaries of a farm, but you also want to understand are there positive or even negative effects also in the wider landscape. So that is coming up more and more. And there we're, for example, thinking defore deforestation for free commodities, right? So you want to make sure that this impact goes beyond the boundaries of an investment. And then, of course, you have the monitoring and adaptive management side where you need to report on the investments that you're actually achieving and uh, is the soil actually improving? Is the carbon sequestration happening as you would think it? Um, the simple example where we did some technical assistance here, there is a project in Madagascar that is looking at Artemisima, which is a, um, which is a plant that is being used to produce um, malaria um, um, treatment. And um, they are complying with national standards. They have been working for a long time, but we helped them do an environmental and social impact assessment to also confirm that they're complying with international standards. Um, and now I look just for a couple of common denominators <laughs> of like, what are you actually running into, which technically could be a problem when you're talking um, data, uh, or environmental earth data. Uh, and uh, I'm using fragmentation, although I've seen mostly it being used in a different context today. But when I'm talking fragmentation, I'm talking about smallholders and like a range of people working in different circumstances. So for example, we have a project in uh, Bhutan, uh, Mount of Hazelnuts, so in the Hazelnuts value chain, and they're working with farmers spread throughout the whole of Bhutan. They're having um, or, uh, hazelnuts orchards like from 600 height meters to 2,500 height meters. Extremely different conditions, different side of slopes, uh, different microclimate, and still you want to be able to say something for the whole project, right? So this is um, where the challenge is coming, but also Sinch Market, which is a horticulture business in uh, Kenya. They are doing mosaic farms. So what you, uh, I was told, that. all right. Now, actually, wrong button, of course. Yes, OK. Um, so Cinch Market, which is um, in the different sense, there's a mosaic farms where they're working with farmers that often have less than an acre of land. So they're quite close together, but still you want to be able to say something about the impact of the project. So you need to be able to say something on a very small scale whether this project really achieves the impact that you're looking for. Uh, other challenge is um, growth harvest cycles. A lot of these companies, uh, like uh, Myra of Comasa, they are forestry companies and they have natural genera uh, regeneration components, which are quite easy to track whether that is going forward. But for the other areas, they're having cycles. And uh, it needs to somehow be um, addressed that it's not necessarily a negative thing if it is uh, harvested, right? So if you're just looking purely at productivity of land cover, you would see dips in your progress. So this needs to be accounted for. So there's, there's a story to be told to the data that you're observing. Uh, or regeneration, uh, rejuvenation project event um, co uh, coffee in Peru. They're regenerating old coffee product uh, orchards. So they're in the end going to have higher productivity. But initially, if you're transitioning, they're going to have lower productivity. So there is a story to the data that is more than just observing your productivity, soil organic carbon, or uh, land cover. Um, and now maybe bringing it <laughs> together in this uh, last slide, um, which is cost and availability of data. And um, so we're talking sometimes that you need quite high resolution data in very remote areas with very small uh, plots. Difficulties uh, for, for like, yeah, how expensive is it to get that? Because in the end, it still needs to make sense for a company to be able to report it. I think the easiest way of doing it is if you can really integrate it in the business model of a project by saying this is not for reporting, this is not for some external cost, but you want to integrate it and say, like, this is why I want to do this, why it makes business sense for you to do it. Some projects are already quite there. They understand this and they want to drive it. Other ones are really seeing it as a burden because they don't have to... Capacity, for example, which is my next point. Like, do they really have the in-house capacity? And for example, looking at the, the what I call barriers, especially after today, I would say there are solutions out there, right? I I'm, I'm actually think that these things can be addressed and you can do something about it, but it needs to be cost-effective and 
companies need, need to be able to pick it up. And some companies are building that internal knowledge because it fits with their business plan. Uh, for example, Kenemar in the Philippines, it's uh, cocoa and banana agroforestry. They're really going also to add carbon to their business model. So they really want to and need to add this GIS data, these, these data components, they want to add to their components. But sometimes carbon can be in something that is very additional to a project in the sense that it's for the farmers and they're just facilitating it or it's about their profit sharing or it's just a, a way of smoothing the business. So it's not at the core of their business. And then they need time and they need capacity to really build this internal knowledge. And I'm even talking understanding the tools out there. There might be free tools out there that are really useful for them and just need to be customized. But it's, it's hard for them to understand where they are and what they can use and where they're going to get this from. So um, yeah, th that is, I think, very much a restrictive point at this point, like uh, where to even start with it. And uh, I'm going to mention it just now because, uh, again, I wonder if there are some solutions already out there that could be useful, which is biodiversity. I think it's uh, one of the projects where one of the areas we want to have impact for. It's a requirement for the fund to monitor it, at least make sure there is, of course, no risks, no negative impacts. But if you have, for example, the project in Rio Sierra in the Colombia, they are in the buffer area of a natural, uh, uh, natural resort, uh, of a natural forest. And yeah, they want to really make sure that uh, the, yeah, they also have a positive impact on biodiversity but we haven't found a way that is possible to use standardized, doesn't cost a lot of time, expertise that these parties don't have. So it's at the moment, it's really more a burden to do it rather than something that they can help them to actually manage and drive impact. So I think that's why I added it here as well. Just this is uh, information on the projects we you do, uh, some in more detail, some very high level can be found on our website. So that uh, uh, as a bit of a background um, for the rest, happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dagwan. Okay, we have a couple. So from the top, um, do you gather data on social impacts too? And what are the challenges around this? Yeah, um, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, um, yeah, some of it is quite straightforward, um, but, uh, and I didn't mention it is enough, so this was really focused on the environmental side. The same thing goes for, for social components on the risks, uh, but also on the monitoring and impact side. Um, I would say that the requirements are quite high level, uh, like um, increased uh, like job opportunities, uh, increased where it gets more difficult, for example, is increased income for smallholders, right? That then you're really struggling to find, like, what are you looking for? Are you only talking incomes from the value chains that you're influencing? But I think it's going more and more towards that you can't see a smallholder as a one crop producer. That's just not it is. They have multiple income streams and they need to take into account. So then it's where it gets complex and also where data collection becomes um, elaborate <laughs> and uh, it needs to be also translated into a system that is on a quick base can because it's one thing to just track impact over longer time i think there are methodologies out there that you can do it but what preferably what you have is data that you can use to drive impact and for that you need shorter feedback loops right you can't wait five years ten years till you know it you want to have it more continuous uh, on it great uh, okay, we'll do one more question and then I'll move on to our next speaker. So uh, last question is, what is needed to support uptake of environmental monitoring tools in developing country communities where IDH works in order to support businesses to qualify for the fund? I think what, what is important is local context. So as much as I think we are, of course, looking to compare and group and uh, the investments and therefore the impacts over many geographies of many projects. But in the end, local context is very important. And uh, often local knowledge is um, not there. Sometimes it is like it, uh, like yeah, in some countries there's very strong research activities and there's very strong consultancies. In other ones, not so much. I think what we more and more do and what we, I think we always wanted to do, but my, my, even more taking a shape now with COVID is that we, we can't have purely international 
researchers looking or like consultancies looking at the local context because there is no, I'll fly over there for a weekend and I'll know how to do it, right? So um, I think we're more and more driving towards consortia, like even if we're talking international consultants, we are wanting to, asking them to um, work with local to get input, but also like in that sense, build local capacity, either within knowledge and consultancies, but of course also within the company themselves. In some areas with when it comes to monitoring, like the companies are actually leading in the in their locations. They understand it better than maybe other uh, other players in the in the same uh, yeah in the same regions. Great. So okay, there's actually one more question. I think it's a quick one, maybe not an easy one, but um, on a scale of ten to twenty years, how many millions of hectares would you like to reach? Me personally. <laughs> <laughs> um, 10 to 20 years, that's okay, that's the LDN fund. Um, let, me, let me see if I can produce these numbers uh, at the, so this, I'm talking LDN fund, they're 15 years fund, so that falls into this region. The, maybe good to say that they have a capital of 208 million, so that gives you a bit of context of what, how much they can deploy. Uh, and I think, if you don't get me wrong, they're looking to have transformed 250 uh, thousand hectares towards more sustainable land use practices. But I'll have to, <laughs> like, I probably would have to confirm that. I think it was 350, but they had in the end less capital to deploy. But just to give an idea of, uh, uh, of the scale that we're talking. But that is hectares, and then they have also goals around, uh, which they have almost reached with their nine investments already, maybe also good to know. And uh, they're doing job creation, where they have already succeed, uh, exceeded their goals, even with only 70% uh, deployed. Um, so carbon sequestration, they are way ahead. So they're like within the projects, they have reached their targets already. So that seems to be, um, but they are doing a lot of, they're doing investments in um, wood into forestry. So then the carbon component works, whereas with Artemisima, they're not gonna do so much carbon. Although I think each would like to prove that there's also soil impact there. <laughs> that still needs to be quantified. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Great. Okay, that's all we have time for. So, thank you so much.